Hello there. Today we'll look at train short test long attention with linear biases enables input length extrapolation, also called alibi by Ophir Press, Noah A. Smith, and Mike Lewis. So on a high level, this paper replaces the position encodings or position embeddings of transformers by a new very simple system that enables these transformers to extrapolate to much longer sequences at inference time than they have been trained on. So you can train on quite short sequences and then inference will not suffer, will not degrade, even if the inference sequence length is much longer than the training sequence length. This goes from two times longer to ten times longer to more. So this builds on what people have learned on of position encodings in the last few years, what works and what doesn't, and it sort of advances this one more step. There's still room for improvement after this, but it's quite a simple uh, thing to do. The code is available, I'll, of course, I'll link to it in the description, and it seems like this might, might be worth a try if you implement uh, transformer-based language models and you want to infer on longer sequences than you've trained on, give this a try. As always, if you enjoy paper reviews, don't hesitate to subscribe and uh, tell me in the comments what you think. All right, let's get into it. So what's the problem? The problem is position encodings, as we've said. Transformers were released in 2017 by the original Attention is All You Need paper, and they already dealt with the question of position encodings. Now, why is that? That's because a transformer fundamentally isn't a sequence model per se, it's actually a set model, right? So let's say you have a sequence of tokens, and in this paper, we exclusively deal with sort of autoregressive text generation, but there's no actual reason why this is the only case where this should be useful, but that's what we're dealing with. So you want to predict the next token from a series of tokens. So here you have five tokens and you want to predict the next one that comes after that, and then the one after that, and then the one after that, and so on. So since a transformer essentially transforms a sequence of inputs into an equally sized sequence of outputs in every layer, uh, the transformer, other than a fully connected network, the transformer itself doesn't really know per se where a particular uh, item is. So for example, for this node right here, the transformer would generate a query and then match that up to keys that are that are emitted here, and then it would route information via the inner product. However, it it doesn't matter if this node here, for example, is here or over here. If it has the same key, the information routing happens the same way. Ergo, to the transformer, it doesn't matter where the inputs are. So essentially, it's dealing with the input sequence as a set and not a sequence. Now, recognizing that the original transformer already had to deal with position embeddings, meaning, you know, if let's say every sequence element comes in and initially, like the initial sequence, you give every token an embedding. So these are your standard token embeddings that you know from word to vec or glove or something like this. So initially you give every token a similar embedding. Now let's say these two tokens here are actually the same token. So the cat and the and, okay, maybe not, but um, <laughs> so two words can be the same, right? In the, in the same sentence, uh, even though they might mean a bit different things because they're at different places. So what you wanna do is you wanna um, augment these embeddings right here by position embeddings. And the position embeddings can be as simple as uh, simply appending, let's say, okay, to all, uh, any of these vectors, I append one dimension, I simply write the position in it. So this is value zero, this is value one, this is value two, I simply append the dimension and I put the number there. This won't work too well because we're sort of in linear space and numbers between zero and one and so on. So there are various schemes how to do this. 
The first scheme that uh, the original paper came up with is this scheme of these sinusoidal uh, encodings, which means that if we, let's, let's go down here. This is our sequence. How do we make the position encodings? And they said, why don't we, or let's make six, why don't we have multiple dimensions of position encoding? So our position encoding is a vector. Now, let's say that um, the one dimension, we simply index a really long sine wave. So the sine wave would continue back here, a really long sine wave by the position. So the, this token would get, so here is the, here is the zero, right? This is a sine wave. So the first one would be assigned a zero, then this one would be assigned like a 0 0.5, this one like a 0 0.7, 0 0.5, and so on, right? Do you see like, so, but then these aren't unique, right? For example, this and this, they have the same one on the first uh, dimension. Let's say, well, in the second dimension, we'll do a sine wave, but we'll make it double, double as fast like this. Okay, and now again, we index all the tokens by where they are. So this again would be zero, this may be 0.7 here. Now this would be also 0.7 maybe, and now this would be, uh, this is almost, this is like 0 0.1. So now you can see this vector here is already different from this vector here. So as you build up your sine waves, you can make them even faster, right? And even faster as you build that up you eventually get unique representations for each position but also the advantages and and that's what the original paper hypothesized is that now the transformer can reason sort of about distances between tokens so it can say well if two things are relatively close you know in this topmost dimension right here I can be reasonably sure they're kind of close together. Right? But how close together? Well, if they're also pretty close in the lower dimensions, then they're probably right next to each other, right? Or it can say, well, I want something that's like, you know, medium size apart from, from this word that I'm on. Not, not right next to it, but, you know, kind of a way. So it would look for something that's kind of different in one of these dimensions. So the hypothesis was that you know, with these things, you could reason about absolute and relative positions uh, from the tokens to each other, right? It, it doesn't have to learn that word relationship between word one and word three uh, and word two and word four separately. It could actually just learn at one point the relationship between any two words that are a bump apart in this dimension, and then that would replicate across. And it could potentially also extrapolate. However, this didn't turn out to work really well. Um, and that is for two reasons. At least this paper makes it seem like that's for two reasons. The first reason is that it, it doesn't, like the embeddings themselves don't really seem to extrapolate that well. So the functions that are learned from these embeddings it's not like they transfer to longer sequences uh, as as much. That's the first point. The second point is these vectors that we build up here, the position encodings, what, what they were doing is they were simply adding them to the vectors that are the word embeddings. And you know, that works fine, I guess, especially if you also train the word embeddings at the same time, the model can sort of circumvent that. But as you go up the layers, as you go up the layers, uh, you have to carry through this information. So now all your computations within a layer have to, first of all, deal with what are the meaning of the tokens and how they relate to each other. But second, it would also have to carry through this positional information to the upper layers. And that's where more follow-up positional encodings made a sort of a, a difference in that, for example, they said something like, well, we don't want to just add them to the bottom. We also, we kind of want to inject them into every layer separately, right? We inject them here, we inject them up here and so on. So the model always has access to the position encodings 
firsthand and doesn't need to carry through this information. So this is one of the improvements that has happened. Uh, the second improvement is to simply switch up the, the sinusoidal encodings uh, by themselves. And that's a thing that we're going to see today. And the third is actually related to the first one a little bit is that um, if, you know, if you say I'm going to inject the position information everywhere, it also matters where and how you eject the position information. So as you might know, if there is an incoming incoming embedding here, um, for every token, we're actually going to create a query, a key and a value. And the trick seems to be that if I only inject the position information into the query and the key and not the value, right? If I inject it into the query and the key, I influence how information is routed here that influences that but then the actual information that's transmitted to the next layer those are the values and i do not inject the position information into the values at all therefore the information that flows from layer to layer to layer has no positional information in it um, at all at least not directly because the value the values remain information of pos position information free. We inject the position information at every layer into the queries and the keys or the computation that we do with them. All right. So these are the sort of improvements that came together in the last few papers. Uh, they compare different embeddings right here. So this sinusoidal is the original one. Rotary embeddings, as they're used in GPT-J, uh, T5 bias, as it's used in T5, and then their new one, Alibi. And here you can see this model, for example, is trained on 1,024 tokens in its training distribution. However, when they t inference, when they make do inference on longer tokens, you can see right here, everything performs you know, quite well. This is perplexity, lower is better. Uh, if you go longer, the sinusoidal embeddings shoot up immediately. So they fail immediately. Also, the, the rotary embeddings, they don't seem to cope super well, a bit more, but not super well. So even if you go double the sequence length, they sort of fail. The T5 bias is better, um, but the T5 bias is a learned embedding, takes more memory and needs longer to compute and to train which is a disadvantage there. Also, it degrades relatively quickly. And then the alibi embeddings that they suggest, they are not learned. They are fixed embeddings like the sinusoidal and the rotary embeddings, but they can deal with way longer sequences right here. So they keep up the speed of not having to learn embeddings. They keep up the not wasting memory on things because they're not learned. They, they don't increase the computation time and they manage still to bias the model in a way that it can extrapolate to much longer sequences. So how, how does it do this? Um, yeah, so here you can see memory stays relatively low, doesn't increase. Um, inference speed stays relatively high. Training speed stays relatively high. How does it do this? Here is the main model, the main way that we do this. So if, uh, as I said, we're dealing with autoregressive language modeling, which means that we're dealing with causal attention. That's why only a triangular matrix appears right here. There is, in my mind, not really a reason why this can't be extended to full self attention. Um, in this case, you would just fill in sort of the rest of the triangular matrix right here. Um, but consider again our model of transforming a sequence to another sequence and just view one single token like this token right here. This token produces Q2, query 2, and it pays attention to all of the keys in the input sequence, right? This is the attention mechanism. The query is multiplied with all of the keys to decide 
where it should get its information from. Okay. Now, if we simply do it like, like this, and this is with the, with the causal attention, it can only actually pay attention to all the keys that come before it. So query two would be multiplied only by key one and key two and not key three because it can't look into the future. So if it were just that, then as you can see from this calculation, there is no notable difference between these and these, right? It depends only on what the key is uh, to decide on the information, not the position at all. Now, what we do is pretty, pretty simple. We simply add, um, we simply add the distance between the two positions. So for query two and key two, this here, the distance is zero because they are the same position in the sequence. So the, uh, this is no token number two in layer L, L, and this up here is token also number two in layer, I'm terrible at doing Ls, L plus one. Okay, that's, that's it. There is no, if there is no, if it's the same token, we don't do anything. Other than that, we add the distance or we subtract the distance right here multiplied by a number M. This is really a number. So I was also surprised M is a number, just a number like 0.7 or something like this. So <laughs> you can see uh, the further into the past um, a given key is. So the further into the past, the more is subtracted from the attention value. Remember these things here are attention values. These things decide if, if this is high, that means that, oh, key, uh, key three is really relevant for query three, right? If this is high, it means key two is really relevant for query number five. Okay. And this, what this here does is it simply says, well, however, the further in the past it is, the more we are simply going to subtract from that value. So whatever value you compute, however important it is, the further in the past, the more we're simply going to subtract from it. And we'll do that in a linear fashion. Right? So if your token is here and you look back, then it sort of degrades linearly. Uh, you know, you just subtract more and more and more and more from that value. You can go, you can go negative as much as you want. Why? Uh, why does why does this make sense? I was first a bit confused. I'm like, wait, you just subtract? Like, it seems like you might want to multiply or something like this. But remember, once, for example, for query two here, we built the multiplication. Sorry, this is a bit heavy. We built the multiplication of query two and key two, right? This is an inner product. And we also built the multiplication of query two and key one. Now, what do we do with the two things? We do a softmax, which means that um, these are numbers and they go into a softmax, which is going to give us a distribution. And the softmax is something like e to the query to key i divided by sum over uh, j e query to key j. So they go into an exponential function. And now you can see why uh, subtracting something makes sense because essentially here we're working, this is log space. Uh, and therefore subtracting something in log space essentially means that you multiply it or you, you divide it uh, by a constant. And you divide it uh, multiple times or by a higher constant, the more in the past it is. Ergo, if this would be the histogram without the biases, you know, with the biases, you simply say, well, whatever is more recent, so the more on the right ones, is going to be even more important. After the softmax, of course, it's normalized. So this be gains in importance and this would drop in importance, whatever it is, right? Even if it were, even if it were, this is higher initially than this, um, it would just decrease whatever is in the past and sort of remain whatever is close by. Actually, it decreases everything, 
but it decreases whatever is in the past more. So it's just a bias that says whatever is in the past is less important. Now, I told you this M is a number. So how do they pick the number? And they simply come up with a scheme. They, they, just, just, they were just like, OK, so uh, first of all, here's the formula. So for routing to, to token i, you take the query, multiply by all the keys, and simply uh, add m times this vector right here. Now I'm not sure if you know the, the order needs to be the order needs to be correct. So I guess if this is the vector right here, uh, the the keys have to be sort of reverse order or something like this because this is the most this adds to the most recent token, this to the second most recent token, and so on. So here is how they choose m. M is different for each layer, right? No. M is different for each head, sorry. M is different for each head. Uh, so they say, okay, if we have eight heads, the slopes that we use are the geometric sequence, the geometric sequence that starts at a half and multiplies each element by a half to compute the next element. For models that require 16 slope uh, heads, it's, it's a bit different. So as you know, transformers, they have multiple heads. So if the, if the, this attention computation is essentially split, um, so you have incoming signal and the attention computation is essentially split over multiple heads. The attention computation is done somehow here, and then it's averaged or added together at the end. And they're simply saying, well, this M number in these different heads should be different uh, because it might be more useful to have a harder slope. It might be more useful to have a flatter slope. So they come up with this scheme where they say the slope is one half then the slope here is one quarter. The slope here, like it's so it's slightly less slopey. Here it's slightly less slopey and so on. So they have these almost like different options uh, and I quite like, I quite like that um, because I think whenever you have sort of parallel things in your architecture, like multiple heads for attention, and I, it's my personal opinion that you should do something to make them different from each other. Otherwise, you just sort of rely on noise and you build an ensemble, which is cool, right? Ensembles are cool. I think you can make them more effective if you say, all of these different options, they're slightly different in how they work. And the model can therefore choose a bit which one to utilize uh, most. Now you can you could still replicate those if you want more capacity or, or, or anything like this. But I'm, I'm generally a fan of doing something like like that. So all the heads have slightly different scopes slopes, as you can see, in how important or how unimportant they make the past. And these slopes are predefined by them. And that's it. So yeah, that's that the M is one number per head um, in the fashion that we've shown the and it's really simple. The drop off is completely linear, right? And the simplicity might be the key right here. Because now we test whether this extrapolates in the experimental results. And you can see that this extrapolates quite well. So I already shown you before, of course, the, the perplexity um, in, what, in what, they, what they've shown. But here is another, another test on the Wikitext data set. So again, we have perplexity on the y axis and the square dots you see they are always the classic sinusoidal embeddings. And they are always trained on as long a sequence as you test, because we've already seen if you make the sequence longer, they just fail. Uh, so here, the comparison is really you train on a sequence and, and that is exactly the length of the testing sequence. So they should be perfectly adapted to that length. Now the top line is the new embeddings trained on 
512. So the top line is trained on this size, yet if you test it, it already performs better. Now, what do you, what do you make of, what do you, <laughs> I don't know what do you make of this. Like the claim is somehow, well, it's just a better position embedding by itself because you can see here it's already better. I don't know. Maybe this is also just experimental, like machine learning experiments in papers always making the baseline worse than themselves. But what we can say is that you can see um, it generally the perplexity decreases uh, or remains constant as you up the scale, even if you've trained it on small um, on a small length. And when you actually train it on larger lengths, so this line starts here, the one they trained here, obviously, I guess they could test it on shorter sequences, but what's the point? Um, you become even better because you've trained on longer sequences, right? And again, you see the same pattern also with the one that you trained on very long input. So in general, you see on long texts, the perplexity decreases as you train for longer, obviously, right? So it still has an effect. You still want to train on as long sequences as you can because that will gain you in performance. However, it's not uh, it's not too bad if you train on short sequences and then extrapolate to longer ones with this embedding. In contrast to the sinusoidal embeddings that just completely fail when you give them anything longer than like 1.1 times the training length. And they have various uh, comparisons about um, perplexity and how many words per second. Here is a cool plot that shows, you know, if you train on the same length as the sinusoidal embeddings, um, you get much lower perplexity and only a tiny bit of a slowdown, it seems, because probably because you inject the um, position encodings into every layer. By the way, have you seen here, the position encodings, they only go to the query and key computation. They don't go into the values at all. We don't add them to the embeddings at the beginning. So this is exactly one of the things we've talked about at the beginning. So this is how they sort of incorporate one of the learnings of the last years. Um, so but because you have to do this every layer, it's a tiny bit slower, but you gain a lot in perplexity. And if you go, if you go to train with smaller sequences, obviously you're going to be faster. And as you can see, your perplexity it doesn't suffer too much. Um, in fact, in their experiments, again, take it with a grain of salt. But in their experiments, it is even lower uh, than the full length training with the sinusoidal embeddings. So they go into, as I said, into various experiments right here. In generally, their message is always the same. There is a weird phenomenon where the perplexity actually gets better as you go beyond um, your training length. And they attribute this uh, in part to the so-called early token curse phenomenon, where it depends sort of on how you split your evaluation data. And if they modify that, they see that, at least as I understand it, they can say that, okay, if for some evaluation protocols, we actually don't get better. So it's probably due to this early token curse, but nevertheless, the perplexity stays flat or you don't suffer that much if you uh, train on short sequences. Hey, this is Yannick from the future. Just a short addendum here to make it clear. And they also describe this in the paper. What is probably happening isn't that the transformer is all of a sudden able to reason about much longer contexts, but what is probably happening is that it still only looks at the most recent uh, context because the more distant past has been downweighted so much by these biases that it becomes irrelevant. But nevertheless, uh, it still enables the transformer to handle these long sequences. And potentially, if something's really important in the past, it can pick up on that. All right, back to the video. 
So uh, all in all, I think this is a very, very simple, cool paper. I want to see in practice really if this works out, if this does something. Again, they've only tested on language modeling, autoregressive language modeling, uh, where I'm not exactly like I'm not exactly sure why they haven't tested it on other things. Maybe they haven't. I've just not noticed it, though. Uh, it should work in other things, but only time will tell if this is really a if this is really worth something. If this is really useful in practice. If there are so many cases where you can only train on shorter things, yet evaluate on longer things. Um, that's why I would be also interested in non autoregressive language modeling tasks, because if you have to say, answer a question about a document, right, it's much more about integrating whole information about the document or finding relevant things in the document. Um, and there I'd be interested in the discrepancy between training and inference. All right, this was it. I hope you sort of understood what it is. Check out the, the code. Apparently, it's really pretty simple to include this in any sort of uh, existing transformer. And yeah, tell me what you think. That was it. Bye-bye.